there, Millennium Live listeners. This is Connor Tui. It's great to be back with another episode of Millennium Live and the Millennium Live sponsorship podcast series. It's great to have another partner with us. And today we are talking about supply chain and we have the market leading supply chain and retail planning platform, Relex, who helps retailers and consumer brands unify their planning from demand and merchandise to supply chain and operations for maximum customer satisfaction at the lowest operating cost. To talk about Relex, we have an accomplished forward-thinking leader with repeated success, building teams, and rolling out strategic initiatives. We have Rich Kerhyatz. He joins the podcast with over 20 years experience spanning demand planning, forecasting, operations, merchandising, and buying from analysts to lead roles. The first half of his career led supply chain initiatives, forecasting centers of excellence, buying and merchandising teams. And over the 10 years, he built a successful growth consultancy focused on financial and operational performance in well-established corporate organizations and growth stage companies. And in the past two years, and the reason we are here talking today, he joined Relex, which is known for their industry-leading unified retail planning platform, which is going to be at the center of our discussion today. He is the lead field strategist and part of that field strategy team at Relex. And he's driving financial improvement, inventory reduction, and cost reductions across retail, grocery, CPG, and distribution customers in North America. Rich, it's great to have you on the podcast. I can't wait to talk to you today about supply chain and this uh, demand planning technology. Connor, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, these uh, it's always a fun time when we get to kind of expound a little bit and expose what we're doing for all of these uh, great customers across North America and globally. And yeah, by all means, we're more than happy to <laughs> run as long as you want to hear about uh, what we're up to. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us, and I want to jump right into it because we got a lot of great points to talk about. Someone, even myself, being new to the supply chain world and having companies like yourselves on the podcast, specifically for our members who listen to Millennium Live. I think it would be great as they hear and meet vendors all the time. What is Relax Solutions and how does it support today's very dynamic and evolving supply chain? Sure thing, Connor. Yeah, much like you kind of covered in the intro and kind of my background, you know, Relax is the market leading, you know, in unified supply chain and retail planning platform. We're really centered on bringing all of these technologies together in one place. So we're working with retailers, grocers, distributors, and CPG or consumer packaged goods companies to unify both their demand planning, kind of building that into their core, uh, their forward-looking forecasting through AI or artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to drive better supply chain planning and also bringing in all the, you know, the constraints that we're working in today to help optimize that end-to-end -end value chain, end-to-end -end plan. And that's really the wide angle of it. If you simplify it a little bit, I like to say well, we, help, we help customers plan better and react less. That's great. I want to dive into about this demand planning technology. How do modern demand planning technologies really address the challenges of capacity constraints, which is a, a big talking point, especially in real time? One of the areas, you know, in the last year to two years, we've heard a massive growth in, you know, the, the familiarity of term around AI, right? Artificial intelligence. And, you know, it's kind of gotten to be a bit of a buzzword and buzz term, you know, in common vernacular with chat GPT. Uh, but in reality, you know, companies have been working on this for years. You know, companies like Relax, you know, we've been around for over 17 years. We've got over, you know, 400, 450 customers. The AI ML really means that it's it's a computer system training a computer system, right? So that cloud native in memory computing technology is incredibly powerful when it's wielded in a way that's uh, really thoughtful and and planful in nature. So we're bringing in hundreds, if not thousands, of different uh, variables, regressors, and then also looking at all your supply chain constraints as well to enable these. Uh, what we're running is you know basically billions of calculations every single night to ensure you know the most accurate and up-to-date data is used to drive decisions along the, the, the path in your supply chain. So with that, the terms of AI and you hear about parallel computing and distributed networks, it's not just about speed these days, right? And everyone kind of we they lean towards well, you know, we, in order to do speed, you need to do it you know up to the second, up to the minute, real time. You know, with platforms like Relax, we're we're planning. Right. So we're not just reacting. We're actually taking in all of that information from, you know, from today and up to the hour, up to the minute. 
But most importantly, we're looking at what's going to happen and planning for what's going to happen days, weeks, and months, and even sometimes, you know, well beyond a year from now. So that way, you spend a lot less time chasing issues as they come up. You know, bringing in these regressors allows us to, to say, well, well, here's what the optimal plan would be. Here's what the actual demand is going to be in this particular region, location, down to that actual product channel level. A person's going to come in and want to buy, if people are going to buy on this e-commerce platform, this product in this amount. Well, we're also then going to take into the real life constraints of, well, here's availability issues. Here's other challenges along the way. Here's what your limitations are in moving product through your supply chain to get to that customer. And here's that risk of lost sales and how you can react within the network to do so. So I would say what really differentiates modern platforms like Relax is their ability to, to really work in this highly granular space and provide highly accurate planful technologies, not just reactive technologies, to, uh, to proactively uh, prevent those auto stock situations have those order purchase orders pla uh, placed on time to ultimately get to you know the old the, the the core construct of you know logistics and supply chain is having the right product in the right place in the right channel at the right time. Right. I like a couple of points that you mentioned. I I want to switch gears just a little bit about the rise of omni-channel shopping and <laughs> obviously within the last couple of years it's it's skyrocketed. I want to get your perspective on how these demand planning technologies are evolving to sort of cater to omni-channel shopping, both online and offline channels at the same time. No, that's a, a great way to look at it because even, you know, as I kind of, you know, drop the old adage of supply chain, you know, the right product, the right place, the right time. But I also mentioned, obviously, the right channel, right? So omni-channel has become not just a, oh, we also offer uh, it has become just a base requirement of the customer, right? The, right? the customer savviness that grew so quickly in COVID, you know, they advanced probably 10 years in the matter of 10 weeks. People expect the seamless omni-channel experience, right? So whether they're walking into a store or they're hopping on their phone on their app, the expectation now is product is going to be there, right? We're not in the situation anymore where it's like, well, I'm going to go into my store and if I don't find it, then I'll see where I can, where I can buy it, if I can get it online, right? The expectation is product is there. And if you're ordering something online, you're going to either get it the same day or within two days. Those customer expectations and the reason I focus there a little bit is really put a lot more stress on supply chains. And I think a lot of us has found that, especially in the planning space, that because of that requirement to have things move so quickly in, in, in the back end of the supply chain, that final, that last mile or that, where that customer is going to pick it up, it requires us to plan things entirely differently. A platform like Relex, you know, being completely node agnostic, it allows us to utilize different levels and different tiers of distribution in the supply chain throughout the network to ensure that we're what we call uh, not just building, you know, virtual locations, but we're actually doing virtual ring fencing. So from the same inventory balance, we're actually kind of privately slicing up that inventory and prioritizing that based on different service levels, knowing that Hey, you prioritize, you've chosen to prioritize your subscription customers higher than, say, some of our walk-in customers. Knowing the walk-in customer, you know, who's walking into your brick and mortar location is probably with your sales folks, is going to make sure they leave with something. But someone who's a subscription customer, there's a base expectation. So behind the scenes, we're we're handling different service levels for the exact same product in the exact same location. And we're able to do that, you know, in a very unified nature, right from the beginning when we're procuring the product, potentially even internationally flowing that through the supply chain, and then bringing that in right to that actual location uh, or sourcing location for fulfillment. So that's really a lot of how that's changed. Now, ultimately, that does require a flex in capacities, both in uh, physical capacities, labor and resources in different levels of distribution, and where you're holding product, right? So you've seen stores having to flex and like carry more and more product in back rooms, having back rooms start taking a bigger and bigger portion of the retail space within locations, you know, even huge companies having to resort to you know, third party locations or expanded warehouse locations to handle these uh these dark stores, if you will. Ultimately, it's the supply chain software's job, you know, in my opinion, and that's in Relux overall opinion, that the supply chain system needs to be flexible to handle that. And that's what we've been able to do, you know, throughout COVID with a number of Relux customers who weren't previously even online or didn't offer buy online pickup on store. We can simply simply activate a channel and a customer becomes already able to, to handle that separate demand. So that's critical uh, in the overall ecosystem to how we're flowing product through and making it available to customers because at the end of the day, they're expecting it. They're not just asking for it. I want to continue talking a little bit more about capacity constraints, specifically in the supply chain. I do want to bring up Relex because one of the awesome things about the company is its tech-driven solutions to these constraints. 
And I want to bring back to, you mentioned how everything you do at Relex is granular. So could you talk a little bit about the role that these integrated technology systems that are really playing, identifying and addressing capacity constraints in the supply chain? Absolutely. And I think that's granularity is key to this entire process, right? There's in years past and decades past, right? There just wasn't the computing power there was today. There wasn't the capacity. We were doing things on prem and a lot of it was heavily, heavily customized. The way we build, you know, modern systems today is that you can run distributed architectures and networks. You have nearly endless computing power, you know, available. Uh, the challenge is, does your, does your current system allow you a level of flexibility? Can it scale up, you know, to that appropriate level? And Relax, because uh, we do have that network and that infrastructure, and we were built natively in the cloud. That's been incredibly easy for us to scale up to, right? Now, I, should, I shouldn't say that because I have, you know, hundreds of engineers behind me that are like crossing their arms. Maybe this isn't <laughs> quite as easy to make it sound. But because we've built the system this way, we're able to bring those, which in the past might have been like an observable heuristic that, right, okay, well, we only have so much space in the back room. Well, we integrate space planning, floor planning, and macro space planning into our into our overall supply chain planning. So we understand both how much space you have in the back room, how much capacity you have in the store, how much capacity you have on the shelf. And based on the planogram, we'll even help make recommendations to how many facings each item should have on the shelf and the depth at which it's carried. So right down to that level of granularity of when something shows up on the shelf, does can it go right from truck to shelf? You know, from, does that box fit right on that shelf? And is there gonna be sufficient demand and how fast will that move in? We're making those level level of decisions at macro macro scale with you know hundreds of millions of product locations. And the thing that I think is most interesting about this is we can bring those in as you know as constraints and then apply them to our overall regressors when we're figuring out what's the forecast and how will that affect the overall consumption and demand and will that product be available? But we also have another way we can handle this is by actually helping make that decision. So we'll actually help you make the decision of how many people, you know, do that labor planning, you know, right down to the cashier level in the store or the back room associate to say, do you have enough labor, you know, in your back room? Did you have enough labor in the distribution center to flow through? And we can either use delivery flow smoothing to kind of determine, okay, well, let's spread out those deliveries a little bit, a little bit better to ensure that you'll actually be able to receive those trucks and flow through that product. Or better yet, if you have Relax integrated to your labor planning, we'll say, we're actually going to need four more people on staff to unload that number of trucks at that time. So we can both be adaptive and work around and be flexible around those limitations and bottlenecks, or we can actually help influence them right down to the level of how many facings of this particular product do we have? And can we make sure that each product has earned its spot on the shelf in that particular location? Because you know, I haven't mentioned it yet. The area that I really think is fascinating is how retailers can be more sensitive to regional seasonal effects. And just mm. truly understand that each store product location has a different set of customers coming in, you know, on a, each day and each week. And being able to plan that way, knowing that a season is coming, knowing that those purchase behavior behaviors typically do annualize themselves, allows you to plan at a granular level, but then in a time phase nature. So it ensures that you have then procured the product you need, set up the labor you need, and then plan accordingly within your stores. That's really the fundamentals of Relax is having that, you know, that tightly coupled plan between planograms, labor, capacity, purchase plans, right down to store replenishment. Really great points there, Rich. I like that the regional seasonal effect, it does have uh, such an impact. And speaking of planogram automations, I feel like that's a game changer at, at Relex and, and you're really putting the power of automations into the supplier's hands. So speaking of technology, you know, you hear all the time about AI and the buzzwords around AI and chat GPT and, and generative AI. There's without a doubt in my mind how it's impacting supply chain and retail. You know, what are, what are you seeing out there, Rich? How, how advanced is it, this AI technology? And and how is it improving demand planning, especially in terms of like forecasting, inventory, and space planning? I, I like to think there's two types of AI these days, right? There, there's purposeful uh, or, or, or pragmatic AI that's you know heavily matured and dedicated to a particular source, and there's also I don't know what I like to call a little bit, a little messier AI, kind of like the, <laughs> the cowboy approach of, you know, chat GPT. You can put anything <laughs> in and you might get anything out, right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the, the prior as opposed to the latter, because I think there's a lot of noise in the market. I mean, you can license anyone's AI algorithm to, to generate a generic forecast, 
right? And there's there's more and more attention on like, oh, look at the cool things I can do with it. But when you start looking at that pragmatic, you really focused in AI, things that we've been training for years, there's really two ways I explain it best. You can you can build these explainable automations, right? So you're taking these billions of forecasts, these billions of calculations that you're running, you know, every single night. Uh, with an intent, right? You have an intentful goal to do something, to to optimize a network, right? There's linear, there's linear optimization, there's dynamic optimization, but at the end of the day, when you're dealing with these billions of lines, you know, lines of uh, regressors and details, like, do you have a system that's tuned then to to utilize that information? And that that's where I think the the most exciting advancements in AI are are the ones that not just that wow, it's widely applicable now. Everyone can kind of bolt on it. Look, I have an AI forecast now, but instead you have a network and a platform and an infrastructure that's designed to receive, receive this intelligence. For Relex, what I think is interesting to see is how many different types of regressors we can bring in. We've done things like we've been bringing, we've been bringing in weather for years, right? A lot of folks have been trying to harness the power of weather. Some people joke, are like, well, they're not really great <laughs> at predicting the weather for tomorrow. <laughs> what are the odds you're going to do it anymore beyond 14 days? And we agree with that. You know, overall, a lot of what we've seen is that that 14 day window is really the limit for even directional accuracy. But the power in weather isn't just knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, or two weeks from now. It's what is going to happen because of the weather, right? So we've got a huge, you know, super tier one partner uh, who's doing incredible things with how they're reacting and planning for, say, hurricane season. And that's one thing. It's like how regionally, how did you source product and with anticipation of what was going to happen that season? They're like, well, what's your crystal ball? How do you know when a hurricane is going to hit where? Like, well, again, a lot of the retail behaviors that occur, occur after that event. So the question is, how did you use that intelligence? Those observable heuristics, was it, was it a wind event? Was it a weather event? How did you use that information then to plan accordingly to say, if this hurricane was more oriented in a wind event versus water event, did you have the right products available? And what's the long tail effect of those? So working with this, this partner specifically, we built out you know, things that used to take weeks or months of planning in advance, now we're able to use it in a matter of hours and planning is only maybe a couple of days, is able to plan for after each of these events, what's that long tail, you know, say 16 weeks plus of different categories spiking, you know, ebbing and flowing, like what categories are going to, categories are going to slow down when and where, and which are going to grow, and then ensuring we have sufficient product levels, you know, available for each one. And that's just one example, but reasonably, just about every type of retailer that we've come across experiences some type of regional seasonal benefits. They're they're experiencing some type of reactive nature to different regressors. And in the past, you'd have forecast COEs, and you know, I've been a part of one and helped lead at forecast COEs before, where you're doing incredible research, you know, into like looking at clustering and advanced regression models of like what affects what categories and products where. You know, it could be right down to, you know, what's the subway schedule affecting, you know, and ridership affecting the overall retailers around each of those stopping locations. You know, we have other you know, other customers that are operating, say, in, in airports uh, and nearby. You want to, what's the transit? What's the flow through of actual flights at what given times? So all of those things you can start bringing into platforms like Relax. And because you're using something like machine learning, that regression analysis work that used to take, you know, days or weeks or hundreds or thousands of man hours to do can be done overnight. And they can, with a high degree of correlation, instead of like trying to overfit something, you can come in and say, not only like, did I consider using over a hundred different regression types and regressors, I picked three that really matter. So the system is always every week, you know, if a platform like Relax is retraining itself, right? It's retraining itself to say, if I use this, you know, this base statistical model, what would my results be? But more importantly, if I'm using a more powerful AI, you know, ML model, and I use this regressor set, which is the most accurate regressor? So after it's done all this work, the last part, you know, really it comes down to the so what? So I go back to kind of how I opened this one is like that explainable automation. This is what's unique that I've seen in Relax that I haven't seen in any other system before is that after it's gone through and done all that work, you kind of get a, you get a really nice readout, almost like a weather report of like, here's, here's the impact each regressor had. Here's where the relative impact and the reason we're using seasonality to this fact. We're using a a, a, day, a weekday model to this amount. Here's how much uh, we expect the promotional effects to be, the pricing changes, you know, any other of those dynamic um, uh, regressors we're bringing in. Here's the overall impact we anticipate it to have. And here's how well we've proven that out to be in previous weeks. So the power of AI in my, my mind is really to help enable us to work better with it. And 
have it produce something explainable and understandable and really move away from a lot of the black box statistical work that, you know, my math degree had kind of brought me of trying to explain to everybody else of like, here's why I think forecast is going to be this. And here's my confidence level. It's like, <laughs> instead, AI makes it all explainable, you know, when it's done well. Couldn't agree more. That was a beautiful way to sum up AI and the technology that's happening now is it's all over the place. I want to make sure we hit our, all our touch points in terms of retail and for retailers, this role of technology that's really enhancing the customer experience and how Relax is helping anticipate that granular demand. Talk about driving growth and operational efficiency. How are demand planning technologies helping retailers in achieving the vision of this frictionless shopping experience and automated operations? I mean, anticipating it, like we talked about earlier, is, is probably one of the most important roles, obviously, of any demand forecasting system, right? The demand forecasting system is really saying, do we anticipate someone coming in or this number of people coming in with interest of this product, right? Or hopping on their app, placing an order for this many products at this time. That's the need of uh, the flexibility and foresight in the system. Ultimately, the, the challenges of the past we're much more focused on let's forecast at an area that we know we can be accurate at the highest possible level and then force that down through a series of percentages and estimations and assumptions. That really gave way to a lot of issues with accuracy. I still get challenged from time to time when coming to a major retail and they're like, what's a forecast accuracy? Come on. What a forecast accuracy can you really drive at a product location day level in my business? And my response is, what decision do you make at that level? Because regardless of whether we're going to exactly even be able to predict whether it's a 0 0.125 versus a 0 0.236 forecast actual demand occurring in that location. That's not as important. It really comes down to what is the propensity? What is the need? What is the, what is the likelihood that an activity is going to happen? But more importantly, what does that inclination do to help us make a determined determination of where to put the product and where to store the product, right? How likely is it to carry it in that store? And then most of, and most importantly, how important is it to you to always have that in stock? And that's how we're measuring things with planning things with service level. I think service level kind of gets a gets a bad rap. Some people think of service level as oh, it's our in stock level, right? Like a seventy percent service level, you're okay with seventy percent in stock. It's really not. It's it's much more about being able to be more tactical with your approach to how you're planning. So a seventy percent service level is you're you're willing to tolerate up to being out of stock, up to a thirty percent chance of not having product there. Now reasonably, if you have a very low forecast, that still might be 100% in stock, right? We may have planned it perfectly and that never goes out of stock, but that's that tolerance. And because those tolerances is in, you know, in a modern system, you're able to set those by channel, by product location a day. That just becomes another constraint or another planning level, planning area that we're using to drive those higher level uh, safety stocks and, uh, and even lead time stock to plan to, to ensure that product is there for the right channel at the right time, at the right day, for that customer to make that purchase, right? So when they're browsing it, it shows, yes, you can get it today. It, when you're, they're browsing it, they say, yes, they can get it next day. It, it aligns with their expectations and the expectations that retailer has set, you know, with their customer. So Relax, Relax is making sure that we have just the right amount of product at the right level and the right tiers or supply chain. It means more and more, you know, retailers are having to keep product closer to the customer to ensure that level of service, that they're getting it nearly immediately. Now, because of that, that can get really expensive. You know, there's some major, major retailers out there in the market that have been hit with that most recently because they're trying to ensure that when a customer comes in, it's there. When they log into the app, they get it tomorrow. You know, to have an Amazon level, you know, of service, it can be a challenge, uh, but it's also a trade-off. So a platform like Relax allows you to, to really optimize your inventory levels as well. So we're typically, when we're coming in, we're taking a pretty significant bite. I've seen 15 up to 20% of average inventory reduced uh, while we're increasing in stocks. And now we're doing that because we wow. are considering, yeah, we're, we're doing that because we're considering that service level that you anticipated to deliver to the customer and ensuring that we're carrying it at the right tier of that supply chain so it can get there right when the customer is anticipating. We're definitely doing our best to cut it close and optimize that balance you know, the, the one area we haven't talked much about yet today that I want to make sure I, I, I bring up, uh, because it's probably the most challenging of all of this, is dealing with things like fresh grocery, right? The expectations for even produce to be there immediately and fresh on time and even delivered, that's really been one of the most trying areas. But it's also where you have some of the greatest proof points of how we can balance, you know, not only now inventory levels, you know, reducing inventory levels within stock, 
but then balancing that with spoilage because you can't just solve it by putting a bunch of product out there, right? <laughs> Blueberries don't last long <laughs> if you put in a couple extra cases. We're really spending our time to tune in how we're handling things, you know, as delicate as fresh, you know, with inventory levels as important as what we're doing in, with slow moving product, uh, but optimizing that kind of end to end supply chain to ensure product is always there. It's not just held, you know, three tiers back in the warehouse, or we're not just shoved, pushing it out to the store because it's too much work and I don't have time to review a hundred million you know, product locations. The system is really helping you start your day with done. Those orders are planned. When you log in in the morning, you see the exceptions in your network and you're able to react right in the system. I want to talk about collaboration, specifically between a retailer and supplier. As I'm sure our, our supply chain officers have understood about recent industry challenges, but what are the benefits of collaborating and collaborative planning and this two-way accountability between retailers and suppliers, forecasting and holding supplier accountable for orders? How have um, capacity constraints impacted the retail industry? And how can this retail supplier collaboration be a solution to these challenges? Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I love that the two-way accountability line because I think it, it really is about that. It's not, you know, in years past, it was really about the two-way communication of like, how do we make sure it's a dialogue? How do we make sure we're we're providing the, the supplier information and they're supplying, providing us inform, information? And then every once in a while, when we get frustrated and we can't get the product that we want, then we we try to charge it back, right? No, no, no. Like that, the, the, those days are gone. Like it's, it's, a, it's tough out there, right? Margins are slim. I think we all know that. You know, the requirements are high from the customers. Their expectations are high. Switching costs are there uh, reasonably, you know, in a, in a modern platform, what you really want to start with is like sharing, you know, A, a highly accurate forecast, B, a, a reliable and consistent, you know, order plan and C, having a means for them to provide input back, right? So if you're going to share an order plan with the supplier, like that much further out, like, A, you want to stick to it, right? Having your forecast kind of jump all over the place and having your end all commit, ending commit, you know, very wildly from the initial the initial communication, but that doesn't do anybody any favors. Uh, but what really benefits and what we've seen in Relax is having that collaborative planning, you know, kind of dashboard where you're sharing those latter plans, right? You have your forecast, you have your orders, here's what we intend to buy by when, and then give them the chance to say, like, hey, we communicated this weeks, you know, or months in advance. And you, at that time, like there were no challenges from your team. Then if there is a chance where it can't come in, you know, having the, having the grounds to say like, well, here's how consistent we've been. We're asking you to do the same. And if we need to provide a forecast even further out so you can produce or procure for us, you know, we're willing to put our neck on the line too for our forecast. So that's part of what we're the, really the first step for Relax is giving retailers and grocers, you know, and distributors, you know, our distribution customers too, just the same way up to manufacturers, giving them a leg to stand on to say, here's how much I'm going to commit to, you know, and here's how consistent I've been with that. And then now that we've had, we've, we're comfortable with our forecast and our accuracy and our consistency, now we're able to take in and allow them to give feedback. So when they start seeing that we're going to start holding them accountable to those numbers, they come back to us and hold us accountable to say, okay, well, if I can't get you this much and I can get you this much, how frequently, like how much further out in advance will you continue to commit to that amount? So now the dialogue changes. So no longer is it just the retailer pushing on the supplier or the supplier pushing back saying, here's all I can get. Here's all you have. Take it or leave it. Right. Now it becomes a more comfortable dialogue. So it's not that the infighting. And, you know, when we talked about, you know, our kind of our discussion today kind of opened with like plan more and chase less. This is a great way to kind of bring your suppliers together into the fold with you. So you both have skin in the game, right? You've got a forecast that you stuck your neck out on. They might have gone to produce product or had to, you know, beg, borrow or steal product from another customer. Like now the expectation is you're going to take it. Right. So that two way accountability, you know, in our in our dashboard is a great place for suppliers, you know, whether or not they are that your supplier is a relax user as well. You know, we have cases where we have customers who are the retailer and the distributor both running relax. That's a very, very easy connection, you know, but in the case if only one end is on it, you still have that platform now to kind of mediate and moderate and update what that supply plan looks like. And then using that as a constraint can then build out your labor plan, right? Can build out your space plan, right? So you're not going to have product of that particular type of product for weeks or months at a time. We're going to, it's going to be flagged in the relax system to say, hey, why don't you take it off planogram in this set of stores for this time period, right? Here's a swap in or a cut in to quickly replace it. Like our system is still highly, highly reactive, but it's done in a planful manner, not in, hey, this shelf spot's been out of stock for weeks. Why don't you shove something else in there in the meantime? Like <laughs> now- 
even retail could trust you better because your folks working in the stores see that the, they got a planogram update that this is going on a stock they sell through they understand the plan so you've drawn you've drawn really drawn uh, together a end to end accountability so just the folks who are talking to the customers coming into your stores they know and trust the planogram that was sent to them they know product is coming to keep those shelves full and likewise the supplier knows that you're going to have a consistent flow of purchase orders to keep those shelves full Obviously, when it comes to capacity constraints, we have to talk about the benefits of proactive collaboration. And I, I think we have to talk about the importance of data sharing and predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. So in what in what ways uh, you've seen, Rich, can uh, shared insights between retailers and suppliers really assist in early identification and resolution of these potential capacity constraints? Two ways. So I think the last one I hit pretty well, and I'll come back to that again, right, is that is having that dialogue, that open dialogue, right? We we saw a lot of issues with, you know, during the chip shortages time period, knowing particular lines of product were just not going to be back in stock. Having the supplier come back with recommendations of other products they could bring in and then being able to update the plan like that, that communication all can be done through our platform. But something else I thought was fairly interesting was uh, the metric around on time and fall, right? Sometimes suppliers are even surprised to find out that we we're keeping a more accurate tally than even they are sometimes of like what pro, you know what DCs are or stores are receiving product you know less frequently than they had even anticipated now because of that you know Relux is able to take that on time and full metric and actually make recommendations through its chain to say we recommend a you know a lead time buffer on some of these things so the system but in the back the back end of things is automatically recommending changes and tweaks you know to the how we how you're managing and procuring so regardless of what how the communication is going between the supplier like Sometimes the supplier's like, I literally don't know. I'm waiting on raw materials. I can't produce a product. As soon as I get to get it, I will let you know. But at the end, by running a platform like Relax, you have these highly granular level metrics being measured at each individual point. You think about it like, like weather sensors all over the country, right? You have these little, these little on time in full measures at every single one of your DCs and locations, ensuring that if things are coming consistently slower or in less uh, full capacity, that all of these measures are being accounted for and buffers can be built, right? You can you can have that set up to auto accept within Relax, or you can be manually handling that, but the things that slip through the cracks sometimes, those are the ones that end up biting us. It's just these little things where it's typically a day late, you know, or two days late. Well, in grocery, that matters, right? That that, that matters a lot. Refrigerated items, I mean, ice cream doesn't keep well <laughs> in the, you know, in the yard before it's being received. So little, little adjustments there, you know, can draw, you know, cause huge wastage issues and huge problems that need to be addressed. So We've got companies, uh, you know, huge, you know, super tier one clients that are flowing, you know, international goods through that need to know those things that it's, you know, a day of aging or two or three days of aging, you know, in a yard is <laughs> that while that might do great for durable goods, that that does awful things to uh, to fresh to fresh product. But as we flow through in each individual tier, you know, it doesn't a platform like Relax doesn't require, you know, a separate set of tools or a separate optimization to be run to say, okay, well, is our, is our multi echelon network optimized? It's like, well, yeah, we, we run that every night. Like that's, that's just, that is a constant imperative of how we're doing our optimization is managing to that network based on the outcomes and any repercussions of what we're receiving in terms from suppliers. We're able to then communicate back up. Like actually we're actually going to have to increase that safety stock level. We're going to need slightly more orders than we had promised just because we've been receiving it from you a little longer than we had anticipated, right? Maybe that comes back in a penalty. You know, there's some, there's plenty of companies over the years who've made this a, a profit center, you know, kind of digging the vendor, you know, charging the supplier back for the, those costs. But it also can be that degree of partnership where you're constantly evaluating performance on the dashboard. There's a two-way, like we talked about before, that two-way accountability and you've got that skin in the game. You're constantly sharing those analytics back. You know, with Relax, you can just automate that sharing. It can be done. It can be pushed through an email or they can log in and see it at the portal. Having that relationship with the suppliers and one that you're, you know, you're providing a, you know, a degree more transparency, kind of peeling back the onion of like, here's why this matters to us, right? Based on your shipment frequency or based on the orders you've been cutting, like that hasn't been delivered completely in full, you know, with fresh items, we've had to, you know, we've had to actually turn away several of these shipments. Here's the lost sales that we're going to see from that. So unless we can do something about this, here's the lost sales that we as a retailer are going to see, but net net, like we're not buying more product from you to fill in for a lost sale, like that's either going to another customer, you know, or to another product, uh, you know, or we're walking the customer all together. So having that vantage point of granularity right down to the individual sale at register of did that go through the cashier or not 
sharing that level of information back up to the supplier does really hold us back to kind of what we talked about previously, that two-way accountability uh, or the ability to handle that, that capacity, you know, capacity issues as they flow through our chain, just knowing that even if they say, well, we'll next day to you, like, well, we know next day is really going to be two days. You know, that it does take longer to get that appointment time than we anticipated. That's the goal of our platform, you know, is to provide, it's, it's provide the facts, right? Let's start with the facts and then a place to, you know, come together and, you know, unify that plan uh, in a way that all of our partners from suppliers to our resources, you know, throughout the network in, in transportation and logistics, you know, right down to the folks, you know, on the front lines and the stores, you know, are able to plan and react to. <laughs> For me, I, ice cream doesn't even last down the block. So <laughs> I forget we could point in, and Rich, I've, you've, you know, you're such an industry veteran and you've seen so much with supply chain. Speaking honestly about collaboration, any real life scenarios that you've seen about, you know, of these collaboration driven solutions? In perhaps sustainability and what we've been talking about with this fresh daily order cycle where collaboration led to innovative solutions really addressing constraints. Sure. I mean, we've got a lot of great case studies. That's a, another thing I really appreciate about Relax. And it's part of what kind of, in, you know, encouraged me to join after a long career, both uh, both within you know corporate organizations and in consulting, but looking at how active Relax is in publishing these case studies, right? So there are so many cases where you know, I've seen the kind of benevolence of this company wanting to share, like, here's what we've learned. Like, here's here's how we partnered on solving this within a retailer. And this this doesn't have to just be an industry secret, right? This Let's actually talk about what we did to solve this so others can learn from it, right? So if I talk about the, you know, the wins of a super tier one company, you know, every once in a while, someone's like, well, maybe don't tell, tell exactly <laughs> how bad we were to start with, right? I don't think my boss wants to know that. But <laughs> uh, you look at companies, say, like like AutoZone, they're a great example. You know, we've got some great case studies published on our website. I encourage everyone to take a look if you want to go through our resources section. Uh, but we've got even a video recorded on that where it kind of talks through some of the challenges they experienced, you know, with their, you know, with all the dist distribution centers across the U.S., Mexico, and Brazil. And then how do they flow product through? You know, there's just little things that you don't always think about of like, hey, what, how does Chinese New Year, you know, affect our network? But more importantly, like, how do we run delivery flow smoothing? You know, to ensure that we're we're ordering up in an appropriate amount of time, we're considering the order differences, we're reactive to it, and we're not just loading up, taking a huge order that just to just bide our time through. But having a multi echelon network like a company like you know Auto, you know AutoZone, it's one thing to just hit pause for a little bit, but when the faucet turns off, it's off, right? Everyone here who's experienced you know the the wonders of Chinese New Year recognizes that out of, out of respect for all of the companies that are flowing these products, like we're still, we're still all planning around them too, right? And they're doing the same thing. They're actually trying to produce this sufficient amount of product. So if we're communicating those orders far enough in advance, uh, and we're able to flow that in through our, our, our network, we can actually do it incredibly seamlessly. That to me is what's really impressive is just how, how we've been able to, you know, partner with companies like AutoZone, you know, across their, their multi-echelon network and flowing goods through an incredibly efficient way to even account for those individual, like which products are delayed by how many days over what time period uh, and what's the degree of seasonality and effects that you'll be missing, you know, during that order period and then flow, you know, very thoughtful and systematically flowing those goods back through the network. So AutoZone's a good one for an example there. I, again, I recommend you uh, folks watch the video on it. I'm not going to do it justice by covering, you know, all of the details today, but they're, they're, they're really interesting to see how we solve things, you know, for hard goods like that, you know, you look at other, you know, other grocery companies of our that we're working with this too, you know, and I keep leaning on that one just because there's not a lot of time for ripening, right? Once, <laughs> once you receive product, like, right. But it is a one thing, you know, you, you got a ripening area for those, but any other products, you know, any other, you know, fresh goods and, and produce, like that stuff's got to move. Right. And any, yeah. any quick shortage of like, Hey, you know, we're, we're, you know, we got a shortage of avocados, right. Or this supplier is unable to get this, or this farmer has this many at this price. Uh, you know, the, we have these huge super tier one companies and here's where I'm not going to mention any names, <laughs> but these <laughs> massive, massive grocers. And you know who you are, you're, you're ordering, you're still ordering, you know, it's not on paper anymore. At least it's in the spreadsheets, but these manual price book ordering systems, the systems are advancing now, you know, and I understand it too, because I've been in the same boat, boat where like, I, I, it's my job to place these orders. So I trust my spreadsheets more than anything. Totally get that. But platforms like Relax, they're designed to handle these constraints. They're, they're designed to handle these multiple vendor ordering situations that in the past, like they just couldn't handle that degree of complexity with all the different prices and the timing. And, you know, and again, at the end of the day, you're working with farmers. So who thinks that like, 
we're going to be able to plan everything around their growing season. But again, because we're so granular, because we're, we're planning at these individual farmer and grower levels, we're able to optimize your purchasing patterns, your purchasing plans, and ensure you get the right product in the right distribution centers at the right time to fulfill those stores. Again, like that's, that's where things get incredibly complex, but those are the problems we love solving the most. So that's where companies, you know, and specifically, you know, Relux, I've been really impressed is we bring in so many experts from the industry. I mean, you can always look for job openings, but we're bringing in so many folks with, you know, years and years and decades of experience, you know, right in the, right in the trade, right in the field that, that no supply chain end to end, that no grocery end to end, that no distribution and CPG, that these industry experts ensure that we're not just selling a product, right? It's not just a software that you're buying, but it truly is, you know, it's that, it's that thoughtful tailored solution and one that out of box does what it needs to do, right? We're not just bending and making, you know, it's not like a new version of Excel that, yep, I can build my formula and it'll do the thing I needed to do. It's like, well, no, we've got the greatest hits from all of these companies that we've worked with globally. And we're always trading that knowledge that while we don't share data, right? We're all single tenant. We keep everything safe and highly protected. We are sharing those best practices. So just like our case studies online, we're trying to grow the industry. We're trying to grow the network, grow the knowledge base overall, kind of open source a lot of the, that thought leadership. That's where I'd always look to say, turn to Relex if you want to have those conversations. I mean, find us at events, find us at booths. We're pretty friendly and happy to, happy to talk to. You know, I talk about values first. And that's where that academic level approach that we have in publishing case studies. And if you've got a big problem that you're working on solving that they just can't get figured out, bring us in. You know, we'd, we'd love to help solve it with you, especially if it's something you're like, this has just been impossible. How do we get to that? Like, that's where we love to play. The only other thing I wanted to just mention quick, because I know you had, you had just tossed it out on the side, is overall on, uh, you know, CO2 savings and, and sustainability. I mean, that, that's another area that we've, we've built entire dashboards on this, you know, because we have everything else measured in this level of granularity, you know, there's a lot that we can do to help publish a lot of this information, you know, provided that, that data and knowledge accuracy is there. Rich, you're a wealth of knowledge, and we could probably have another hour uh, conversation on supply chain. And I, I would love to have a part two to this, but just sure. to, I, I want to wrap, I want to wrap up this episode, especially I like to end Millennium Live with a question more surrounded about the future you know we talked about well first of all i, I want to thank you for your time but you know i to make sure the blueberries don't go bad we'll have one more question and it's going to be about sustainability and sort of the future of supply chains and resiliency and agility technology is going to continue to advance we know that since it's been a topic of our discussion today how can managing capacity constraints effectively lead to waste reduction and have a more sustainable impact and a more sustainable supply chain? You talked a little bit about it, but um, any any uh, examples would be uh, would be awesome. I know you mentioned about CO two reduction and and food waste reduction. So what are you seeing out there, Rich? I would say that's the crux of you know everything we've been working on for well over a decade now. I mean, Relax isn't new to the block. You know, it's it's become a it's become it's it feels like a new name. You know, and it's not like we rebranded or anything. We've been around for over 17 years here, but we've been really dedicated to the grocery space, you know, all the way from the beginning. Food waste has been a key target of, you know, our company and our three founders. You know, we've got three founders who met in the, their PhD program. You know, think about that. Wow. Like over 17 years ago, they're still heavily active in our organization. You know, they're, they're out there, you know, visiting with our customers. They're, they're very active with our overall, you know, company and community. And a lot of what we hear about is, is just that. And I think it's a great question to end on because if we do our jobs well in supply chain, right, in demand planning, and we are really, you know, end to end accountable for, you know, the right product, the right place, the right channel, you know, at the right time, we are reducing waste, right? We're not carrying, you know, excess cube volume in our, you know, in all of our hard goods. We're not spoiling out product, you know, in the distribution center or on the truck on the way to the store or on the shelf, right? All of that planning, that end to end planning is so critical and so crucial all along the way because things might look great when it's a, you know, it's a small percent, right? It's like, oh, it's only two to 3%, right? Some, you know, some of our you know customers, they come in or before they become our customers, they may, maybe their spoilage is say only like four or 5%. If we come in and can help them reduce that by 15 up to, you know, and well over 20% in some cases, you know, that's, 
that's a huge cut of food waste. That's a, a big drop in overall CO2. And I think we we all have, you know, an obligation to be, you know, that good, the good corporate, not just good corporate citizens, but good, good global citizens too. Just thinking of like, what are we doing then back in return, right? How do we quantify the overall good we've done in, in improving the efficiency of a supply chain? If we're reducing the number of trucks, we're reducing the number of times we touch things. We're improving the, the overall horizon and the planning window that we have to make those reductions. You know, I think Relax, we've stood behind it. I think our numbers have even gone up then. We've taken out, we've reduced over 11 million kilograms of food uh, food waste, you know, and, re- and taken out over uh, 35,000 tons of CO2 just in the last year. Uh, awesome. And since then, it's only continued to go up. Our goal is to help all of our other customers and quantify that. So we already have these dashboards built into our, com- you know, into our platform that you have, you built a, you know, the nice part with Relax, you have all the data in one place, right? You get one source of the truth. So whether you're trying to do, you know, optimize your overall network or look like what's the net effect? What are the kind of the scenario planning situations and how do I optimize my profit? We can also turn that back to say, well, what's all the good we did in the last year? And like, if we did this, what would that reduction of CO2 look like? I think the biggest limiting factors that we have in the space today are just making sure that we're getting, you know, good, accurate accountability of what those CO2 limits are. You know, what's the CO2 limited over the overall life cycle, you know, from farming to processing to packaging and transportation. But once we have those inputs right, we can dial that in with each one of our customers independently. And we've got a handful that we've already started to do that. And you'll see, you know, more and more on the folks' uh, annual earnings reports that that becomes not just even an addendum, but a, a separate, you know, full accountability, you know, handbook showing all the great progress that they've made. You know, helping people to like work for, a, you know, when they're working for a company, see their in, their net impact of doing all this good, that it's not just for a bottom line, bottom dollar. And that and that is all good, because quite honestly, that's what fuels our economy and fuels our companies. But also by working smarter, you know, not just harder, not just doing the daily grind of chasing orders and trying to get your job done at the end of the day. It's when you add a system like Relax that's able to, you know, run in these billions of calculations like what and allow you to kind of start your day with, you know, a finished set of orders and a plan that that optimal level of planning is now flowing right back to the balance sheet, but more importantly, back to the environment. Like here's that positive impact. Those accolades, I think, are going to continue to become a forefront, you know, pillar for a lot of organizations and customers are looking, you know, customers are looking at what companies are doing good and doing best by our environment too. And that efficiency, again, like we talked about in the beginning, just ends up paying dividends, right? That's how you use AI, ML, you know, to understand how to improve your supply chain, you know, improve your accountability and improve your all overall footprint in the environment. Well, that's awesome. And uh, it's clear that the vision at Relax is this adaptability and efficiency. Thank you so much to you, Rich. Uh, I've learned so much already. And even this just short time speaking in the supply chain industry, it's so expansive and I'm learning so much. And I, I'm sure our members will really appreciate you coming on to the podcast today and speaking all about Relax, the market leading supply chain and retail planning platform. Hope to have you on the show again. We'll, we'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Connor. It's been a, it's been a pleasure as well.